Number 10, mudlarks. Victorian London, around the 1840s, it was a bit of a mess. Yeah, a lot of sore throats, that's for sure. Everybody was sick all the time and the jobs that were available certainly did not help the cause. The jobs that were available had you catching rats and crawling into sewers. One of the worst jobs to have was that of a mudlark. As their name hints towards, a mudlark involved getting in deep in the muck that builds up alongside the Thames River. This one was reserved for younger folks, obviously, because it was like working in quicksand. If you were older, you would just get trapped. It was pretty sad. It was also exhausting, not to mention the chances of being washed away by the river were pretty high. All for the slim chance of finding a pocket watch, driftwood, rags, anything really worth your troubles. Number nine, chimney sweep. I remember when I was younger, I had to sweep the chimney in the house every now and then, whatever, and I personally, I loved it, you know? I thought I was the father of the house for a bit, getting in the chimney, getting all dirty and stuff, doing this, my hands on my, on my waist, I don't know, it's, that's, that's what a man was when I was younger. That little broom too, I love that little broom. I remember when I would do this, my grandmother, who is very English, she would be shook. She would watch the entire time. She would be taken back into time because this was a terrible job to have in Victorian London. I was, yeah, it was not the same at all. Chimney sweeps were famously young. I can't say anything else there in regards, but yeah, they were, we lads, to say the least. History is horrible. 1840 was a good year, all things considered, because a law was passed that then made it illegal for anyone under the age of 21 to climb in and then clean a chimney. Thank, thank God, I'm glad that stopped. I was 18 cleaning my chimney. I had no idea I could have used this great law. Been like, actually, mother, a lot of claws. Number eight, toilet troubles. Now, the Victorian era was unsanitary, to say the least, but it was also dangerous in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? Go to the bathroom and may not come out. One of the greatest Victorian inventions was that of the bathroom, but it took a few tries to figure out the whole, you know, methane gas problem. We gotta really deal with that one first and foremost. Spontaneous combustion of the bathroom was weirdly common. This would, uh, this is how, every time you take a shit, you were worried that you might just Woo! That was horrible, that's so scary. Flammable gases like methane and hydrogen sulfide, they would build up over time with human waste. Human, a, a, a lot of human waste. Built up in the sewers and then eventually would back up into your homes. Next thing you know, you're lighting a candle and your bathroom's gone. Just like that. Now we have poopery. You know what that is? You ever see a little spray? After you go, you just, you hide what you've done with one little spray at your friend's house. It's fascinating how far we've come. Number seven. Funeral mute. Funerals suck, man. I was a pallbearer like three times before the age of 21. My one arm is just strong as fuck now, that's it. I can lift anything just with one arm. I thought being a pallbearer had a lot of pressure, right? Victorian London saw many, many funeral mutes. Oliver Twist, one of those lousy jobs in that tale was that of a funeral mute. Funeral mutes were required to dress in all black with a sash while carrying a long cloth covered stick and your job would essentially be to stand and mourn silently at the door of the recently deceased home. Yeah, guy dies of a plague and you're like standing there like holding your breath like great, this is the worst job ever. You would then lead the coffin to the graveyard. So a lot of responsibility. Yeah, don't trip or breathe. Number six, stairs. Yeah, believe it or not, stairs were a common danger in Victorian times. I'm somebody personally who falls up and down stairs a lot. I'm 6'2". I'm lanky as shit. I have like a Gumby body. I walk around like Woody. I'm always falling up and down stuff. It's horrible, especially in Canada. It's so slippery. I'm always, always slipping all the time. In Victorian times, I would have been doomed. Houses were thrown up comedically fast. There wasn't a Mike Holmes on Holmes to come in and check it out. There wasn't a building inspector that made things, you know, safe. Servant staircases, they were tiny. They were out of sight. They were built into these narrow walls, often missing steps that they had to and cut corners just to, you know, be narrow and out of the way. That plus a tray of hot soup and a lot of clothing, yeah, it was next to impossible to move around without something happening. A lot of fatalities and staircases. Even today, around 12,000 people die each year falling downstairs. Hold on to that railing. I'm here to remind you, to hold on to that railing. It's crazy. There's actually no stairs there. I just made that whole thing up. Hit that like button for magic. Number five. Burke and Hare. Medical schools were offering a handsome fee for deceased bodies to study. This was, this is an odd time. So an unhealthy amount of Victorians came up with this new solution. They thought they were brilliant. Yeah, they would rob graves. They would just go and rob the freshest graves they could find. They would wait in the bushes until the funeral's over and then they would go and 
disgusting. It got so out of hand that family members were actually guarding the graves of recently deceased overnight. That's how bad it got, that's disgusting. But nobody goes down in history like William Burke and William Hare. They were an unlikely duo, to say the least. They wouldn't wait until the body was done living. You know what I mean? They would actually kill people and rush the process, all for a pretty penny. 16 victims in total between 1827 and 1828. It took 16 victims for people to start catching on to this weird plan. The pair would lure victims into their house, fill them with alcohol, and then they would suffocate them. They had a sick system and they would suffocate them because the body needed to be in the best condition possible in order to receive a payout from the Edinburgh University Medical School. So they would, you know, try and keep it as clean as possible, which is horrible to say, but it makes sense. The Anatomy Act in 1832 put an end to this horrific plan. Number four, bird hats. Look, I don't have much to say about this next one here because, well, all right, yeah. I love a good hat. I've worn a few hats here throughout my time on bumblebee, some baseball caps, some beanies here and there, sure. I've never worn a dead bird on my hat though, and I don't think that I will. That's for certain, I might just leave that out. Taxidermy was a hot topic back in Victorian London. Folks would rock the dead beaver bowler hat, any animal they would just prop up there, and it was considered fashion at the time, believe it or not. It was a dangerous trend though, long term. Conservationists were saying that 67,000 species of birds were all at risk of extinction due to this crazy dead bird hat craze. Can you imagine just a stuffed seagull on my hat? I'm like, all right, number five, here we go. It's crazy. Also, that's like a lot of weight, you know what I mean? A lot of weight on your head, just kind of, oh sorry, there's just a dead pigeon on my head, so my neck's kind of sore. What if the wings opened up and you kind of just like got some air? Maybe that's why they did it. Number three, holiday cards. Today, these Hallmark holiday cards, they go way too hard. And they also have a card for everyone and everything, you name it. Birthdays, weddings, stepdad's name day, you're like, what? That's so specific. Like they have everything covered, but back in the 1800s, these holiday cards, they were brand new. Nobody knew what to write or say, so they would just end up sending these artistic sentimental scenes. It would be like a frog in a top hat riding a bike. No caption, just that. You'd be like, hey, Merry Christmas, I guess. It'd be like a carrot with a face. It'd be a haunting image, really, to receive from a loved one on Christmas, but it's the thought that counts, I guess. This holiday season, just give your parents a card with this on it, and then see what they do. Don't even write anything. Just stare at them in the corner, all Victorian-like, and be like, Mother, father, Merry Fortnite Christmas. I don't know what they would say. Number two, lots of arsenic. We of course have to mention a big problem in the 1800s. Arsenic, everywhere, all at once, okay? Skin lotion, tons of cosmetics, it was a nightmare. Even if you didn't use any facial cream or anything, it was everywhere else. It was in wallpaper, it was in dresses, it was in toys, medicine. My gosh, it really was horrible, it's a nightmare. And it's because arsenic was cheap at the time. It was during the Industrial Revolution. It was being unearthed more and more and finally, come 1851, the Arsenic Act was passed, which fixed a lot of issues. Yeah, we regulated that one not soon enough, but we definitely got that one fast. And finally, number one, Jack the Ripper. Unidentified to this day, we've got to end on a horrific note. Everybody's just finding out now about Jeffrey Dahmer, it seems. He's a hot topic on Netflix. But what about Jack the Ripper? How did he get away with it this entire time? Why aren't we going to see a Netflix doc on him? Ever. Jack the Ripper was active in the East London neighborhoods, primarily targeting sex workers in the area. Now, at the time, the murders of five women from August to November of 1888 were believed to have been connected somehow to Jack the Ripper, although some sources claim that he was active even until 1891. Again, we're never gonna know at this point. Many believe Jack the Ripper had some anatomical knowledge due to the way that he left his victims. I can't really say anything else because it's disgusting, but yeah, he knew some things, disgustingly. And while there were some suspects, including a member of the British royal family, believe it or not, Jack the Ripper was still never identified. Number 10 is it wasn't illegal to drink. Now that can be confusing since as you probably already know, the purpose of banning alcohol was so that nobody drank alcohol. However, you'll learn today there was a lot of loopholes around it. For example, the 18th Amendment forbade the manufacture, sale, and transportation of intoxicating liquors. So so by law, if you already had them in your home in 1920 when the law dropped, well, it was yours to keep and enjoy in the privacy of your own home. Most people only had a couple bottles, some had whole wine cellars, or some ran to the grocery stores to clear out the entire stock so they could have an illegal, legal stockpile at home. Number nine is another loophole, how to hide the booze. Like teens at Coachella, the people of the 1920s wanted to sneak their alcohol around. So how did they do it? Well, some larger examples are faux books that were actually a flask, easy to bring to class or to your weekend visit 
visit at your mom's. Lamps and globes were also popularly converted into alcohol stash spots. Want something more portable for a movie theater or a park stroll? Well, how about a hollowed out cane or umbrella? Women even wore garters at the time, so they made tiny little flasks to fit in those as well. They're really cute. These tricks get more strange and messed up. One unhurried smuggler is documented being caught by US custom agents after he dropped a basket of eggs. The agents discovered that the smuggler had carefully poked holes in all of the eggs, drained them, filled them with alcohol, sealed them back up. There's even an example of a tailor using a tailor's dummy that was literally 12 pints of bottles sewed up by the tailor in the shape of its body. Number 8 is how alcohol survived as a drugstore prescription. One exception to the ban on distributing alcohol was that drugstores were allowed to sell medicinal whiskey to treat everything from headaches to the flu. By the way, what was more messed up here is that the fact that alcohol was being prescribed and how some doctors orders were things like take 3 ounces every hour until stimulated. With the physician's prescription, you could obviously pick up a pint of hard liquor and it was every 10 days that you were allowed to do so. Obviously, if you found a prohibition hating pharmacist or doctor, it would be easy to schmooze or bribe or even just ask for an alcohol prescription and just be given one. Also, it's hard not to see profit. So many pharmacists and doctors started their own secret speakeasies and then also many prohibitionists also operated under the guise of being these pharmacists and doctors to have these speakeasies as well. According to the prohibition historian Daniel Orkent, windfalls from illegal alcohol sales helped the drugstore chain Walgreens grow from 20 locations to more than 500 during the 1920s and into what it is today. Number 7's messed up fact is drunken husbands are literally the reason why women were the ones at the forefront of the prohibition movement. The anti-alcohol sentiment was on such a great scale with women as in the times after the civil war they had just seen the returns of their beloved husbands alive. But they were always going to the saloons which were particularly booming spots at the time. In short, many wives saw liquor as a home wrecker and were pissed that their husbands were coming home sloshed every day. Unfortunately, the drinking levels did lead to more reports of domestic discourse as well as poverty. Since so many women pushed for prohibition, it actually helped lead to women's suffrage as male prohibition supporters and government realized if women could vote, they'd increase the votes in favor of prohibition to unforeseen levels and make the bill pass. So remember, if we did it once, we can do it again. Don't play with us. Fear mongering is number 6 as misinformation and odd beliefs really did mess up the public perception of alcohol. Some unbelievable claims of the time were that alcohol would turn your blood into water like a reverse internal Jesus situation or that wine was made from crushed cockroaches. Another fun one is your brain would catch on fire from drinking and seeing as hangovers existed people used those as their proof. Secondhand smoke? Oh what about secondhand alcohol in the room? Apparently the sight of alcohol could affect adults and and children so it must be hidden. What if you went blind from seeing it? Apparently your liver could grow 25 pounds from a beer a day and if that didn't happen then edema would get you. Prohibition era enforcers really came up with a slew of untrue unrealistic claims. This did cause an issue post prohibition as the fear mongering was dismissed and people simply waved away the idea that alcohol could be bad for you for quite a long time. This obviously increased addiction as well as diseases perpetuated by alcohol consumption. Oops. For number 5 people converted to drink. Another loophole in prohibition law is that wine could still be consumed for religious purposes, something done in both Judaism and in the Catholic Christian religions. When prohibition hit, conversion and enrollment in churches and synagogues soared. It is significantly easier to convert to Catholicism or Christianity than it is to Judaism, so those were the first two choices of the three. Many men preferred to avoid the circumcision that was required of them even in adulthood. Cities also saw a huge surge of self-proclaimed rabbis and priests who obtained their wine for congregations. When investigated, sometimes these congregations didn't actually exist. Similar to the pharmaceutical and doctoral industry, even a religious man could enjoy a little bit of a drink and find ways to ensure those around him could enjoy it too. Number 4, we see the birth of NASCAR. Okay, I know it's not necessarily messed up, but there is no way I could learn this and not tell you. Bootlegger cars were stripped, framed, modded to the nines, and armored up. This is actually the same thing you'll see today with how NASCAR vehicles need to be stock, having traditional car bodies instead of those you see in the Formula 1s or the Indy cars. Bootlegger cars also had a false gas tank, removed back and passenger seats, and a modded engine and faux floorboards that aided in the 3 billion dollar smuggle industry, when they weren't racing each other of course. The act of racing wasn't only for fun, as it prepared drivers
lures for police evasion using unique tricks and confidence in their ability to speed away safely without losing any precious cargo. A representative of the Mob Museum stated that many future NASCAR drivers cut their teeth bootlegging illegal moonshine in the 1940s, such as NASCAR Hall of Famer Junior Johnson, who won his learner's permit by running corn mash hooch before his NASCAR debut in 1955. Before and even after prohibition came to an end, racing these high performance cars became a popular pastime amongst runners in North Carolina, Virginia, Tennessee, Georgia, and elsewhere in the South. They raced each other's cars, many of them Ford models, on weekend afternoons out in the country on makeshift dirt tracks, what would evolve into the National Association for Stock Car Auto Racing, or NASCAR, in 1947. Number three was waiting to watch the economy boom. Instead, it slumped. Fantastically. Let's learn about it. It was expected in the dawn of the dry era that casual consumption would thrive. Clothing and household item sales would skyrocket, and leisure activities like artistic dance and theater productions would be selling out as people sought new forms of entertainment. Manufacturers were excited too, thinking that chewing gum, grape juice, and soda, all alcohol supplements, were going to be in the highest of demand. And with saloons closed, neighborhoods should be able to clean up, and new store spaces will be available. And that means a raise in rent, right? At this point, crime could even potentially disappear and clean, respected civilians take its place. So it makes sense for towns across the US to sell their jailhouses, right? Yeah. Man, they thought alcohol would change all that? Wrong! All across the board. Restaurants closed, having lost liquor profit, and theater revenue declined. Then came unemployment. Brewery, distillery, and saloon workers were out of work, but so were the barrel makers, the truckers, the waitresses, any trade relating to liquor. Instead of new stores opening up, everything was closing down, and now unemployment and poverty was on the rise. The rate of crime skyrocketed. Good job selling your prisons because now you have criminals rising to the level of infamy still reputable in modern day. In whole, the economy was messed up big time from the government's decision, as was their social structure. This is something that took years to undo, even when alcohol was reintroduced into the public domain. Number two, we see invading the space. What do I mean? Well, segregation was a law during the Prohibition era, but that was also when American jazz was starting to boom with young white Americans. Despite the segregation many of their parents encouraged and supported, young white people start to venture into black communities of cities like New York and Chicago to indulge in their speakeasies and their jazz bars. Now this is a majorly dicey violation of a community's safe space during a time when they needed to cultivate it, as they only had each other and faced discrimination from those outside of it. But white voyeurism brought economy into it. Dance crazes of the 1920s such as the Charleston Foxtrot and Lindy Hop were popularized by mostly the white crowd bopping along to the jazz music. This was great for the black musicians and pro prohibitioners alike, so came the begrudging creation of black and tan clubs, exclusively found in black communities. However, the interaction in these desegregated clubs were usually stylized, a watered down, romanticized, and stereotyped version of black life that was more palatable for the new flow of white consumerism. As a result, black and tan clubs were more symbolic than any real socialization or actual mixing. Some clubs allowed anyone to enter, but then they would stretch a rope across the dance floor and bars so that white and black dancers wouldn't mix or use the same bar sides. Many clubs would cater to black clientele during the day and then switch to only white people at night with black musicians only being present. Sometimes they were purely white clientele with black staff no matter the hour. So while white socialites who felt themselves to be progressive pleasure seekers infiltrated these clubs under the guise of cultural appreciation, it left black artists, staff, and customers of the time to stay wary in the communities they should feel safe in. For number one, we hear about government poisoning. As you heard from one of our previous points, the government really boofed this whole thing and got pretty much every assumption wrong. So like petty children, they kind of lashed out in the worst way possible. In their effort to minimize illegal consumption, the US government believed that by poisoning illegal alcohol, people would be discouraged from drinking it. The poisoning was done by processing the illegal hooch through filtration so they became industrialized alcohols, which means it's undrinkable and used for things like medical or mechanical. A good example is hydrogen peroxide, and I encourage you not to look up what happens when you drink that. Instead of discouraging people in in 1926, there were reported 400 plus deaths as a result of this government initiative, and a year later in 1927, 700 reported deaths. Originally, smugglers found tricks around this, and they managed to filter the alcohol to be resold again. Unfortunately, the government simply used different techniques to ensure the poison stuck, knowing full well what would happen when it reached the consumers. Kicking off the list at number 10, Together at Last. Remember when you were a kid and your mom would bump into their friend at the grocery store? That was the worst. While they caught up for what seemed like hours, you were bored out of your mind just staring at like bags of rice and cleaning detergent. That's when the shrew's fiddle comes in. Two women would be locked together, hands included, and face each other. 
all because they were too loud or they were arguing. These were used in the Middle Ages, most commonly in Germany and Austria, and the contraption would have three holes, one for each wrist and the third for your neck. Now sometimes they would attach a bell to these shrews fiddles to alert the town that the victim was walking by, you know, in order to talk smack, maybe huck a tomato or two. But the double fiddle, that was the worst. You weren't released until the argument had settled. Some families have an argument shirt where they put the two little siblings in and they can't take the shirt off until they get along. This is like a horrible medieval ages version of that. Much, much more uncomfortable. Not made of cotton. Or funny. Just bad. Just all bad. Number nine, point blank period. All right, babes, let's try not to shudder, but let's talk about periods for a second. Aunt Flo, the Red Sea, Shark Week, so many names to describe a pretty sucky time for people who get their period, right? Well, it might suck these days, but back in the medieval times, it was a hell of a lot worse. They just didn't have the same kinds of resources that we have today, so a lot of people had to use their noodle to figure out how to get by. Period products weren't really a thing back then, so people had to get creative. They would use rags or other linens to fashion a pad, but underwear also wasn't really all that popular yet so they had to find a way to keep things in place. They would also sometimes fashion a makeshift medieval tampon of sorts where they would wrap cotton fabric around a twig and shove it up their hoo-ha. Sounds mighty uncomfortable if you ask me. Some people would also seek out bog moss because it was remarkably absorbent so they would make their period products out of that sometimes too. This type of moss garnered the name blood moss because of its use in treating wounds and use in period products. For other people who just couldn't create these kinds of things, they would just resort to wearing red the whole time so everything just kind of blended in. Menstruation, but make it fashion. Number eight, the ducking stool. This next one requires so much effort as like a team. I can't believe this was a real thing. The ducking stool was made to punish women involved in sexual activities. How dare you? Shame. Men were punished too, but if we know anything about history, it was mostly women who had to put up with this shit. There was first the standard ducking stool, so women would have to sit in this chair, strapped down while sitting outside of their home, or they were carried down the street. Humiliation at its finest. The town would be like, that sucks, can you believe it? Let's take the day off work and embarrass them now. Losers, they're the losers. So stupid, so backwards. The second version of the ducking stool was essentially the same thing, only it was ducked into a river over and over and over again to cool her moderate heat. At least that's what French writer Francois Maximilien Misson says. They should cool off all those angry villagers, if anything. I don't know, dip them in the river. They're the ones burning with rage because somebody who lives over there had sex once. It's really weird, go home, relax. At number seven, Satan's incarnate. Back in the medieval age, women were very much oppressed and incredibly misunderstood. I mean, they thought so many women were witches, and as time went on, the criteria for diagnosing a woman with witchitis or whatever got bigger and bigger to the point where literally any woman could be accused of being a witch for the most BS reasons. Back then, people thought that women were Satan's incarnate, and so they were predisposed to sin, and therefore, they had to be witches. Logic, not quite present, but go off, I guess. There were four reasons why a woman could be considered part of the devil's posse. One, because it was believed that women are foolish and gullible, which is why they turned to magic. Two, because women are insatiable when it comes to their carnal pleasures, and so they seek out help from the devil to satiate their needs. Three, because women talk a lot and we speak lies, apparently. And four, because women are weak, and the only way we can seek revenge is by using magic powers and spells. Now what in the balls is this all about? I don't know. Maybe men in medieval times were just jealous that they couldn't kiki it up with the devil, or because they knew deep down that women run the world. Number six, nosy neighbor. If you were a man back in the Middle Ages and you had an affair, well, you would have to pay a fine. And then that's it. You would go back to your life. But if you're a woman, like everything else on this insane list, it was so, so much worse. Affairs happen a lot, okay? It's normal. Remember that Ashley Madison scandal back in 2015? It sucks, but also it's not surprising at all. This isn't news to us. Back in the Middle Ages, women were treated the worst for these affairs. They would take their noses off. They would literally take a woman's nose and or ears off of their face because they had an affair. Frederick II used to punish adulterers by using renotomy. That was the removal of one's 
knows. The whole point of this was to make the victim unattractive. Isn't that the worst thing you've ever heard? This is a real thing people did, swear to God. Thing is, nobody is running around confessing that they're cheaters. Somebody has clearly spilled the beans, so they knew what was gonna happen if they got caught, yet they would still rat each other out. Meanwhile, the guy just pays a small fee. Snitches get stitches, just saying. At number five, married young. Lots of people get married at different ages. I mean, I know people I went to high school with who are already married, and I know people who didn't get married until later in life. But in medieval times, women, or rather girls, were getting married off at very young ages. At just 12 years old, a girl would reach the age of maturity and was then entitled to marry, usually to someone her parents had already chosen for her. To me, that just sounds so unfair, right? I mean, this kid hasn't really been able to live their life, make mistakes and learn from them, and now they're expected to be a wife and soon a mother? I could never. I mean, I'm only 22, so I'm not even thinking about those prospects, but I couldn't even imagine the amount of pressure that would be on a 12 year old at the time. What's worse than just the age at which these girls got married was the treatment that they received from their husbands. Under civil law, a husband was literally allowed to physically harm his wife. In moderation, of course. It was actually a medieval tradition for husbands to quote, treat his wife as a pupil and teach her manners. As you could imagine, this made a lot of wives really mad, and so many wives offed their husbands. But things rarely got better after that because if they were caught, they would be sentenced to burn at the stake. Note to self, don't get married in medieval times. Number four, the walk of shame. We've all heard the term walk of shame at some point, but what does it really mean? And also, where did it originally come from? Well, it was originally referred to as a skimmington or rough music. I know, it doesn't mean they would blast Slipknot this whole time. This was done to wives who were bossy or overbearing. They would be forced to walk through the entire town barefoot, all those crooked, horrible stone roads, ankles just toast, it was horrible. They would also be scandally clad too because why not? Because men are making the rules, that's why. And as you guessed it, crowds would be waiting outside, all prepared to bang pans and yell horrible things at her. I guess these dudes just never had jobs. I don't know, they were just always on standby, ready to yell at a lady walking by through town, bare feet, all because she was deemed too bossy. Okay. If you're wondering who exactly is responsible for these public humiliations, um, the court. The official court. Judge Judy back in the day would be like, yes or no, did you raise your voice? Okay, case dismissed. Take your shoes off, we're done here. What a joke. At number three, ladies of the night. Sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do to get that coin, right? We all have our side hustles and dead end jobs to be able to afford rent and whatnot. And sometimes we're not exactly proud of the work that we do to make money. It was the same back in medieval times. People had to find any means to make money and for a lot of women, they used what their mama gave them to support themselves and their families. One of the more positive sides of life for women in medieval times was the fact that being a woman of the Night was actually a recognized profession. Later on throughout the times, this profession would be deemed illegal, but in medieval times, it was as common as being a baker or something. These women were actually considered to be merchants because they sold their bodies as if it was any other sellable good. Being a woman of the night was such a common and widespread profession that nearly every town in medieval times had a brothel, even in towns with small populations. So yeah, maybe they didn't have that big of a marketplace, but they no doubt had a place where you could go Go see some quality mommy milkers. Number two, grand theft witchcraft. If you were a woman in the Middle Ages, you were accused of being a witch pretty often. They thought women communicated with the devil, like Bree mentioned earlier, just because some townsfolk with three teeth said so. Great, thanks, Abe. Good job, good report. The punishment for practicing witchcraft wasn't a heavy fine, like guys who cheated, but they would be burnt at the stake. This was popular in Scotland along with drowning. Those are the two big ones. Remember earlier how I said women would sometimes be dipped into a river or a pond? Well, they would also sometimes just be left there. It's called witch dipping, and depending on if she floated or sank, that's, you know, Witch or not, the dumbest thing I ever heard. If you were charged with treason or witchcraft, that was the ideal punishment, because it surely beats burning to death in front of an entire village. This all got out of control come the start of the 17th century with the Salem witch trials. That's when people were like, you know what, I think this is wrong. I think we should stop, let's put this torch out. I think we're good. That's when 19 people were executed for being witches. God forbid you knew how to do bed mass in the Middle Ages. Also, that's a lot of coordination to get that many townsfolk together and be like, okay, you need this, you need this. How many people are standing here? Almost like you would use basic math to figure that out. You're a witch too. Spoiler alert, we're all witches because we know things. I don't know, I hate this. And finally 
finally at number one, Crimes of the Heart. For some unknown reason, people were really out here in these streets in medieval times trying to accuse women of everything. Witchcraft was a common accusation, but the other common crime that women were often accused of was adultery. But you see, the thing is, Someone could accuse a woman of adultery even if she never had physical contact with another person. Now, how the heck does that work, you ask? Well, it depended on where these people lived. During the medieval age in the Byzantine Empire, it was considered adultery if they spent a night outside of their husbands or parents' homes. In Slavic parts of Europe, a woman could be considered guilty of infidelity for simply going to a public event. I'm pretty sure with this logic, if you even breathe in the same general vicinity of a man, then you could be accused of adultery. I mean, what the F is that up? The only bright side, I guess, is the fact that when it came down to punishments for adultery, men usually got the worst punishments in comparison to women, however, they would be accused of this crime way less often than women, so I guess in a way we still got the short end of the stick. Damn it. Number 10, Tar and Feather. This is something my mom always said to me when I was being too loud, boisterous, or distracting her from a task at hand. I'm sorry mom, it's just what I do. Mind you, looking back, perhaps it wasn't my fault. Perhaps letting a hyper child eat chicken mac nuggets and soda after watching a bunch of 007 movies was not the right choice, mother. Hmm. I used to be a big 007 fan. After running all over my house, my mom would say, son, if you don't settle down, I'm going to tar and feather you. Well, in the times of Vikings, this was a legit punishment and for legit criminals. The crook's head would be shaven and covered in tar, which even that alone sounds horrible. And then a poof, I guess you describe it, of duck feathers was thrown onto his stickiness. He then would have to run through a gauntlet and everyone would be tossing stones and bricks because, well, I guess tar and feathers weren't enough. If you made it out alive, then no further punishment was required. Number nine, banishment. Hey, look over there, it's Scorgamore, said Ulfric or someone of another Norse-like name. Like that? Don't worry, Norse sounds confusing to me too. What's not confusing however, and very straightforward but still pretty harsh, is banishment. If someone was found guilty enough of a crime, they could be banished from the village. And in time of wild beast disease and, well, other vikings eyeing your village the same way flies look at cow manure, it was dangerous to be alone for that extended period of time. So some people were forbidden to come back into town and don the name Skorgenmore. Grr. We'll go with that. Good luck in the winter, that's all I have to say. That's a tough life. Number eight, fines. Surprisingly enough, one of the most common punishments of the Viking era was fines. Nothing deters criminals like owing the governing body some cold hard cash. Except a lot of criminals don't really have any money, hence why they would steal in the first place, so owing money isn't exactly a great deterrent in my opinion. However, fines varied on the severity of the crime and who the person was or what the person was, and the law of the land really. Viking civilizations didn't exactly have a written law and would differ from different lands. All I know is that in Skyrim, which is loosely based on that of Scandinavian folklore and Norse mythology, that when I get fined for committing a crime that I only did because I pushed the wrong button, I promise it was an accident, I immediately pay the fine and pickpocket it back. It's not so bad. You pay a fine, you get away. It's not, it's not so bad. Number seven, outlawed. This one is kind of interesting. So oftentimes, when choosing the punishment for a criminal, it came down to fines, banishment, and outlying. And a lot of times, all three. Outlying went hand in hand with banishment. In a nutshell, it means you are no longer protected upon the laws of the land. So, should someone maybe want a little revenge, there's not much you can do. Should have committed that crime there, cowboy. Like I said before, this was oftentimes done to those who were banished, so not only were they tossed out of the village, but also not protected by the village anymore. Pretty much leaving the criminal to nature and whatever she has to offer. And we all know Mother Nature, she can be a little, uh, a little rough sometimes. Woo. Number six, rodeo. If you're gonna be dumb, you gotta be tough. This world is rough, if a man's gonna make it, he's gotta be tough. Wise words from a trailer park supervisor. Huh? This one is just crazy, stupid, and violent, so strap in, folks. There was a trial, or a way of passage, if you want to call it that, that involved grease, a cow, and a criminal. You take the angriest cow in your herd, and you grease its tail up like a fat dude whose thighs have been chafing all day at a water park. The crook's hands would also be greased up. The cow was given a not too PETA friendly poke from a farm tool, and the idea was while the cow was rightfully mad, kicking, stomping, and uh, mooing, the crook would have to hang on. 
for as long as possible. If he did and didn't let go, then there was no charges. If he did fall off and slip and let go, then, uh, well, <laughs> so long von Schlurgenbergen Foreman or Ulfric. That's a Swedish name or something, I think. I don't know. Number five, Meat Hook. Sometimes when given fines, it wasn't always cash value that was taken. Sometimes if the crime was heinous enough, the evildoer's property and items were taken instead. Well, sometimes folks didn't like having their stuff taken, which makes sense, they put up a fuss. No one likes their stuff getting taken. Just ask George Carlin, he knows a lot about that stuff. Everybody loves their stuff. In order for authorities to take possessions from the convicted, they would slice their ankles open, which just talking about that makes me sick. And then for good measure, tie them up and suspend them from the ceiling from a beam in their house. No, not unaliving them, keeping them very alive, just severely hindering their movement and ability to say, hey, get your hands off my limited edition Obi-Wan Kenobi Lego set. That one's mine. Number four, tree hugger. I hope you folks at home aren't eating during this video. It's about to get a little mortal combat in here, if you will. Even though I watch videos when I eat. Carpet cleaning videos, anyone? Where's my lunch, you know what I mean? I, I, I love, I, I do weird things like that, I don't know. The second most horrible sentence the Vikings could bestow upon their criminals and dredges of their society involved a tree. I'll get to the first one later, it's pretty heinous. It involved a tree, a knife, and a squishy rope. Squishy rope, what? Yeah, I'll get to that. Trees being great symbols of Norse mythology and culture, it made sense to do this here. Shout out to Yggdrasil. Oh, cool stuff. You take your perpetrator and you carve open his belly like a high school jack o' lantern contest and you pull his intestines out and you keep pulling them out till you've got enough to wrap around the tree. And you basically tie him there. Except you don't wrap him around the tree, he walks himself around the tree until he's out of string like a sick yo yo. Oh, gross. This was extremely painful and not quick at all as humans can live for a couple hours without their squishy rope inside their belly. Not to mention it probably attracted wild animals for a quick and easy meal. Not a good way to go. Don't recommend that. That's sick. That's twisted. Number three, drowning. Given the naval status of the Scandinavian nations at the time, it makes sense that they use water. It's simple, it's cheap, effective, and there's a lot of it. When a serious enough crime was committed, sometimes people were drowned, or in later terms, they ran out of oxygen underwater, tried to breathe underwater, overpowered by the tide, or was left unattended by the city swimming pool, if you catch my drift. Number two, trial by fire. There's water and there's fire, of course. Well, if cold water was too much for you, then this should warm you up. Trial by fire was more of a punishment uh, and less of a lethal one, if you will. If you survived the ordeal, that meant God was on your side. Thus, they couldn't be guilty because... Yeah, that, that totally works. The trial by fire included a couple different heat-based trials. No amount of red potion or Goron's tunic would get you through this. There was one version that saw people dip their hands in boiling water or oil, which right there, uh, you ever seen those like women's commercials where they dip the, nah, anyway. Walking across hot coals, which can be proven to be done without getting hurt. I saw it on Mythbusters once, so if it's on Mythbusters, that's just truth, folks, come on. Lastly, the one thing that I think is the worst is holding a hot stone or iron for a determined period of time. Yes, how long do you think you could hold onto a red hot iron? I say not long. Even with seconds of exposure, you would have close to third degree burns, probably third degree burns on the palm of your hands, and long before polysporin, painkillers, and toilet paper. Not a good combo. That you, uh, don't, you have a burnt hand, you go to do that, you know? Ooh, that's not gonna be good. That's You're gonna get a little sick. Number one, this is the worst one on the list, the Blood Eagle. The Vikings were very creative, to say the least. I just had to include this one, it's awful. And in the style of Mortal Kombat, of course, you take a crook, you take his back, and, and you rip his rib cage out of his back. It was cut out from the chest and positioned in such a way that it looked like an eagle with its wings flying, just, you know, with a lot of blood, hence the blood eagle. After that amount of carnage, you would bleed out and experience excruciating pain. Not as common as other things on this list, it was safe for the worst of the worst, but yeah, it is the worst, no thank you. At number 10, water carrier. These days, we have it so easy. We have the internet at our disposal to learn about pretty much anything. We have cars to get us from point A to point B, and all of our resources are close by. We get food from the grocery store and water from the taps in our houses. But back in the Middle Ages, things were a lot tougher for people, and they had to go through a lot just to get basic life necessities, like water, for example. Getting water to people wasn't as easy as you might have thought, and so that's why getting water became a whole profession. In a medieval city, you lucked out to 
depending on the area that you lived in. If you lived close to a river or stream, then you could get all the water you wanted and pretty easily too. But if you weren't so lucky to live near this resource, then you might have had to hire a water carrier to fetch it for you. People sought out strong young men to become water carriers for them, and as the name implies, they would get paid to go to the nearest source of water and bring it back for their employer. This profession became pretty popular in the late medieval period in London, and by this time, so many people were working as water carriers that they created their own fraternity. At number 9, Town Crier. I'm sure you've heard of the Town Crier at some point in your life, right? They're often incorporated into pop culture pieces that take place in the medieval times. When you think of the Town Crier, you might also think of the famous Hear Ye, Hear Ye that is associated with the speeches of the Town Criers. Back in the Middle Ages, the role of the Town Crier was a very important one as it was a crucial way for the local authorities to communicate with the residents of their community. The Town Crier would often make announcements of new laws, royal proclamations, the start of events, and even the punishments of criminals. They were basically the news anchors of the past. Also, as I mentioned, we normally associate the town crier with the phrase hear ye hear ye, but the phrase first started off as oye oye oye, which later evolved into the phrase that we are more familiar with. Before we carry on talking about these strange jobs from back in the days of old, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Reeve. These days we have elected officials in our communities who serve as a sort of voice of the people. Back in the Middle Ages, they sort of had someone similar to that and they were called Reeves. The Reeve was something of a local administrator and their job was to oversee the day-to-day -day running of a manor as well as to solve disputes between the peasants. The Reeve was a peasant too, but they were normally elected by their neighbors or chosen specifically by a lord and served as a Reeve for a one-year period. This job eventually faded away as the feudal system began to decline, but fun fact, you can still find some Reeves in parts of Canada. At number 7, Scribe. These days, most people know how to read and write. It's part of our basic education and is one of the first things that we are taught as kids in school. As you progress in society, basic literacy is taught more and more throughout the world, as some people in parts of the world might not have access to this privilege, but back in medieval times, most of the population was illiterate, which made the roles of scribe so crucial. Not everyone had access to the right education, but for those who did and could read and write, they often became scribes. The role of the scribe was as straightforward as the name predicts. Essentially, their job was to write. Scribes were hired to write all kinds of documents ranging from letters to business contracts. One of their hardest jobs though was to copy manuscripts, which was a job that may have taken a scribe several months to complete. Many men and women in monasteries held jobs as scribes, but for common folk in villages, being able to become a scribe was seen as highly valuable as well. At number 6, Peddler. This next job from the Middle Ages is one that we kind of still have these days, just a little more modern. We're talking about peddlers. You know how there are people who go door to door trying to sell you something? Like back in the day when Avon used to do house calls? Well, this was essentially what peddlers did. Their job was to travel from village to village to sell various goods. This was how a lot of people in more remote areas were able to buy certain items. The peddler's job was pretty important for the local economy because it was able to bring business to larger areas than just one local town. It seemed like a good enough job, but socially speaking, peddlers were always looked at with suspicion. Oftentimes, local people would accuse peddlers of being criminals. Now, they easily could have been criminals, but it's really a case-by-case -case situation. You can't judge someone for just trying to get their coin. At number five, Gong Farmer. Now, now, even though there were simple jobs like being a scribe and carrying water to people, there were also some messy and not so glamorous jobs as well. This next one I'm about to tell you about was definitely one of the worst jobs that you could have. See, there was a time before modern sewers and plumbing were a thing. This was a pretty icky time because rather than waste being disposed of in sewers, they were deposited into a privy or cesspit. Now these things had to be cleaned out periodically and guess what? There were people who were hired to do just that. The gong farmer was someone who was hired to maintain the cesspits and so they would be given a large ladle and they would scoop out the waste and transport it away. Now I can only imagine how horrible that job would have been and how horrendous the smell would have been too. It sounds like an absolute nightmare so I'm glad it's not a thing anymore. At number 4, Galley Rower. 
Now as bad as it might have been to be a gong farmer in the middle ages, there was apparently a job that was much worse that people would do anything to get out of and that was the galley rower. This was considered to be one of the most grueling jobs from the middle ages and I can see why. These people would be tasked with working on a galley and rowing a ship along with a team of up to a thousand other people. Apparently people hated this job so much that they would try and avoid being picked to be a galley rower at all costs. Many people would join the pre priesthood in order to become exempt from becoming a galley rower. Usually this job would go to the poorest peasants and even slaves as it became more and more difficult to find people for the job. That was one occupation that everyone agreed was the worst. At number 3, cup bearer. Now this is a job that I wish was still around. Not because it's a great job or anything, but I feel like it could have been cool to have my own personal cup bearer so I could feel like a queen, you know? The job of the cup bearer was pretty self-explanatory. Their whole occupation was to serve the monarch their drinks. Now I know I said I would have wanted a cup bearer so I could feel like a bougie queen, but the cup bearer's job was a little more important than just serving drinks. See, there was always the fear that the reigning monarch could get poisoned because it was a very common act of treason back in the Middle Ages. The cup bearer was the only person tasked with serving drinks to the king or queen because they had to make sure that it wasn't poisoned, even if it meant tasting the drink themselves before serving it just to make sure that all was well in the cup. A lot of trust had to be put into this cup bearer so they could be quite influential in the courts if all went well. They were risking their lives and safety doing a pretty basic task, but it was for the good of the realm. At number two, alewife. Speaking of drinks though, let's talk about how the drinks got into the cups and who made them. In medieval England, women were mostly tasked with the practice of brewing ale and they were aptly named alewives as a result. Alewives were very important not only for business but also for the good of their families. Brewing was a quote, small scale, low investment, low profit, low skilled industry, but it brought success to a lot of married women as well as a substantial amount of independence since this would have essentially been their business and their own source of income. These women would always be hard at work brewing because they sold their ale quite quickly. Ale didn't have a very long shelf life and so they would make and sell their beverages quickly to keep up with demands and to compete effectively with others in the trade. Eventually though, the alewife was extinguished by the 15th century as brewing became more commercialized and people sought to take the independence of women away. And finally, at number one, alchemist. As you can probably imagine, science wasn't all that advanced back in the Middle Ages. There wasn't really much understanding of how the world worked. Back in these days, there were people who tried to practice science in a way that they knew how before many advancements in the field came out and these people were called alchemists. These alchemists believed that it was possible to change metals and chemicals. They tried to purify metals to change them into other things, and one of the most common experiments was trying to convert tin into gold or silver. For other alchemists though, their mission was to come up with new medicines to heal people and cure them of their ailments. Alchemists were quite popular until the 17th century as the ideas behind alchemy were replaced by the science of chemistry. I guess you could say that alchemy walked so that chemistry could run. Number 10. No calling, no gifts. This is a time in history when men were told to be gentlemen and women told to be ladies. Naturally that came with some weird social practices. For instance, women were discouraged from accepting gifts from men. Personally, I like to give my girlfriend flowers and chocolate. I'm a classic guy, what can I say? Can't go wrong with that. However, even if a handsome silver tongued devil such as myself were to give some flowers and the finest dark chocolate a 7 Eleven has to offer, and a most promising woman were to accept said gifts, she may not be able to call me back. Literally, because well, the phone isn't exactly a thing yet, and also because that's something else women were just discouraged from doing. Pfft. Call on a man? No way, Jose! Even if he is super nice and waiting for a genuine response. One etiquette guidebook from 1882 called any woman who calls on a man ill bred and positively improper to do so. I like when people give me flowers and chocolate. Maybe call me sometimes. I'm a little lonely. Number 9. Act like a lady. How dare ladies do anything unladylike? Ugh, said every man ever in the Victorian era. This is a time in history when ladies gotta be ladylike. That means makeup, corsets, and, and don't you dare do anything masculine. Ugh, that's me angry. This is still a time when food isn't the greatest either, so imagine if you got an upset tummy at the dinner table. Happens to me a lot. You've got a handsome prince that your parents have arranged for you to marry. When you go to greet him, you do it with a simple gesture as kneeling to curtsy 
could turn your linens a certain shade of embarrassment that 1800 stain cleaning technology could never wash away. You'd poop yourself. Where's Billy Mays when you need him, right? How dare a woman do such things as go number two, or even worse, break wind? Oh, the nerve. That's just the way it went, folks. I don't make the rules. Number eight, charged with love. Naturally, this was the past, and not being open to homosexuality was just the way it was. Especially when tucking yourself into bed at night alone wasn't allowed either. Homosexuality just wasn't gonna happen. They, they just weren't gonna be approved of it. It's just how it goes. It sucks. However, it's almost as if there's been love on this earth since day one, and to stop that kind of love, it's just silly, man. Wherever I go, everyone is welcome on this channel or my Twitch. Chetty loves everyone because in reality, this is a time period where you could wind up in jail for that kind of love. And as Awesome Powers would say, that's just not very groovy, baby, yeah. Strangely enough, homosexual relationships between women might have been completely overlooked as they were sometimes mistaken for women being friends. Yeah, I know. Some women even lived together, but given that they probably needed each other for financial support, people just kind of thought that's how it went and they ignored it. It's like they live together and you start putting the pieces together and it's like, you know, they, I don't know, something weird going on there. But love everybody, come on, be nice. Number seven, a good thing. If I'm talking about medieval times, there's a good chance I'm gonna bring up the super not cool, not fun, do not condone or support the behavior of marrying a woman at the age of 12. Yucky. In part one, I mentioned that there was a ton of corners and streets being worked by the only other job besides street cleaners at 3 a.m. by women. However, after venereal disease was becoming a serious issue, it was getting pretty bad. It was becoming clear that a lot of people who were getting sick were young women. Like, 11 to 16 age group. Oof. Which I shouldn't have to tell you is bad. That, that's pretty bad, dude. When I was 16, I was rocking Black Ops 2, hanging out with my buddies, and partying hard in the summer. I got a lot of good stories. Maybe I'll share them one day. Catching all that nasty stuff is no way to spend your youth. So thank God the government changed the age of consent to 16 years old, which I know is not a solution for everything that was going on, but it was a small step forward in the right direction. That's what we like. Good history moving forward. We like that. Chetty likes. Number six, the seam seamstress. Being that the industrial revolution had started and business was booming, people needed to travel for business. Or more specifically, men needed to travel for business. Which means they gotta be away from their wives, and that means they are away from the very thing we're talking about today. Bedroom stuff. How did men solve this issue? Well, there was no shortage of ladies roaming street corners to uh, aid in, in that matter. However, there's an option with a little less syphilis. There were AIDS or early blow up dolls called travel ladies. Strangely enough, it was stored in a gentleman's hat. What? That's so wrong. Once it was ready to be used, it was inflated and reassembled. This is a quote from an ad from one of the products. It is inflated to the essential part of the woman wanted by a man. That just, that just doesn't sound very good. This is why we have boards of people to check stuff from products before it gets shipped out to the public. I feel like that just wouldn't fly very well today. Number five. Big polluter. This just doesn't make any sense. It never did to me. And it still doesn't. But in case you didn't know, self-pleasure was a big no-no. Commonly called self-pollution, which honestly is very funny to me. That's just hilarious. Don't self-pollute yourself, Chris. That's bad. Don't do that. That's naughty. It was a sin and thought to be a cause for many ailments. I'm sure you've heard the classic saying that for guys, if you decided to go bump in the night by yourself, there's a good chance you'd need a walking stick because it would make you go blind. Women were also targeted, however, as for any pearl polishing by women was thought to be hysteric and needed to be treated for such. Look, the truth is, any man who wants to wax his carrot or woman tuning a one dial radio should be able to do so without judgment of society or medical remedies of snake oil doctors. Love yourself, love everybody else, and just, as long as the bedroom doors close, you're good. Just, just don't do it in public, you're good. Number four, shake and bake. I'm something of a scientist myself, but that doesn't mean I know everything. And if you actually need to learn something about health and safety, take it from a professional, not a second rate John Candy. However, when coming across this fact, I just had to share it. Cause with my medical knowledge, this just doesn't sound right. All right, so kids, we know how they're made. I don't need to go into detail for that. However, there was this idea back in the Victorian days that if a woman danced shortly after doing what mommy and daddies do, then there was a chance that her pregnancy just 
wouldn't happen. Or perhaps more commonly after riding a horse. S same idea, uh, okay. Which is frankly, horse. I mean, come on, my mom always told me when she was baking that I had to be quiet and stop running around the house or the cake she was baking wouldn't rise. Well, they always did and I love chocolate cake. I mean, really I do. I'm starting to wonder if there's a connection here. I was a rowdy kid. Number three, the Kensington system. Poor Queen Victoria. I know this is kind of a stretch, but it relates back to the whole mistreating women thing. But basically, it was something implemented in order to control the young royal, make her dependent on her mother, whom she was not allowed to be without. Basically, modern day strict parents. Now, all the kids watching right now, or all the kids who've grown up, how well did that parenting work? Let us know in the comments. I'm willing to bet it created a little bit of a divide between parent and child, am I right? That's exactly what happened with Queen Victoria. Shouldn't be surprised, really. Being a parent is tough. I get that. But squeeze too hard and the sand falls through the cracks of your hand. Victoria wasn't even allowed an hour to herself. And I don't care who you are, no matter how charismatic or bubbly, everybody needs some alone time. Number two, a healthy breakfast. Okay, not Victorian London, but this is just too funny not to mention, and it's around the same time period, very close. As the great minds of the time thought, self-pollution was a big no-no, and the reason for these urges was often related to food. Some thought eating meat would make you down bad, so a man named John Harvey Kellogg, you might have heard of him, aimed to cure the sickness of self-love. What if a man had a delicious, nutritious meal to eat, especially at the start of his day? Cornflakes! by Kellogg's, the, the very same cereal that's probably sitting on top of your fridge, yeah, was partially originally designed to stop you from feeling those carnal urges. Now, not sure if that works. I mean, go ahead and tell me how you feel after eating a bowl of that. I had one this morning. I feel fine. I don't feel any different at all. I mean, I'm just, well, not really feeling the same about Pam Anderson anymore, though. Number one, rising action. This could get some married couples into some trouble if they're watching. So sorry. It's gonna be hard to talk about this without saying it because YouTube will send a stern letter if I do, but here it goes. The deed was not considered done unless both parties had signed off on it, uh, had their toes curled, reaching the peak, your magnum opus, the way I feel when I eat at McDonald's, DEFCON 1, or simply mispronouncing organisms in health class. I feel like once you're involved, you're involved. And to me, that's a done deal. You can't really reverse it from that point on, regardless of any of my euphemisms, but that's what they thought. They thought if you didn't, you both didn't climb that mountain together, it didn't happen. Cause science. Number 10, Boy Jones. What's more intimate than a stalker? Am I right, ladies? If there's one thing women have loved throughout history, it's having every second of their privacy being watched by some creepy man, right? No, I can only imagine it's been worse since the dawn of smartphones and social media. I just, that must be horrible. Well, as it turns out, there were some real creep wads in the Victorian era too. The boy Jones was a stalker of Queen Victoria, who on multiple occasions snuck his way into Buckingham Palace, one time escaping with a pair of the Queen's underwear. What? Arrested multiple times, but still somehow found his way back to the palace. But what they should have done was swap the queen's underwear for a pair of mine after a shift in the garden center I used to work at. Oh yeah, nobody's coming for you after sniffing those bad boys. Oh! Number nine, graceful words. This was a time when ladies were supposed to be ladies, and that means manners are on the table and elbows are off. Dresses were worn to not show ankles, God forbid an ankle or wrist bust out. I think more importantly, however, or rather unusual that is, is that women were expected to talk a certain way. Good evening, Mr. Barrows. You must excuse my tardiness. There was a dreadful man screaming at me because my ankles were shown whilst mounting my carriage. Your what was showing love? Oh, you hurdle it. I can't believe it. Excuse me. I must be someone else. I don't need to tell you guys how ridiculous that is. I say fly out the handle, ladies. Wear what you want, do what you want. Number eight, shots. Not the kind I like. Well, I don't know about you guys, but nothing ruins the mood for me and my lady like being fired upon. Yikes. I'd like to stay the night, kid, but the automatic gunfire coming from outside is starting to get to me. 
See? All gangster impressions aside, things must have been that way for poor Queen Victoria as she was shot in her carriage in 1840. A young man fired two shots at her carriage. More attacks would actually follow in the coming years. It's kind of hard to feel that certain kind of way after bullets go grazing past your pretty face. The worst thing that ever happened to my generation was making sure nobody was home when you were studying with your boyfriend. I was too busy playing Call of Duty, but at least I never got actually shot at. You know what I mean? That's just a good thing. Number seven, expectations. All right, this one goes out to all the married ladies in the audience. Hello, how are you? I'm doing great, thanks for asking. I'm curious as to why you got married and what your expectations were. Did you marry your high school sweetheart and live happily ever after? Maybe you had a shotgun wedding and after one night at the saloon. Maybe you just really wanted to find a nice man and settle down, start a family, be a mother. I think any of those options are great, so as long as you have options. In Victorian England, you were expected to do the latter. Women were expected to get married and have kids, and that's about it, really. My question is, why were angles and wrists an issue, but giving birth isn't? What I mean is it's kind of a compromising position to be in. All I'm asking is that the girls get treated fairly and given choices and be allowed to show some ankle. It doesn't make any sense. You can look at her business down there, but you can't show an ankle. That doesn't make any sense. I'm a magician. Number six, double standard. Divorce sucks. It's no fun. The person you once loved and cherished is now the villain in your story. I love McDonald's and I don't ever want them to be the villain in my story. I love you guys. Gotta get those Happy Meals. Divorce is something that isn't new. Honestly, it was probably invented the second after marriage was. In Victorian times, men had the right to divorce their wife if they had committed adultery. Women could not. Well, if you refer to my last part, you know that men were doing more than a little window shopping when it came to women. When men left town for business, they would have hired the services of a woman who patrol the streets at night. No, I'm not talking about Batwoman either. So men can divorce women if they dare to do what they did on a regular basis. Yeah, that's that's totally fair, not, yeah, that's good, equal, absolutely, yeah. Number five, emo girl. All the forever alone people, raise your hand. Let me hear you roar XD. I like to joke around a lot and say I'm a lawyer, a firefighter, and the cutest guy on the whole wide internet. But if there's one thing I know, it's people. I like people. I love them. I spend a lot of time with them, and after hearing this, I've come to the conclusion that this is where the emo girls come from. I figured it all out. It's down to a science. I'm a scientist now. Do you ever get that feeling in your tummy on Valentine's Day because you know it's going to be another one alone? And you'll be forced to be on your own, and, and, and that means sad music and crying in your room. Same, it's, it's Drake's Marvin room for me. Well, single women in Victorian times had similar issues. Since women were expected to marry and have kids, single women who were also forever alone were pitied by society, which I argue is just way worse. Who, who, no one wants to be pitied. Ugh. Number four, gold diggers. She take my money when I'm in need. As she drive it. Okay, anyway, back to the actual content. Well, not exactly. While today in a place like sunny California, you might see an older man with a woman who's half his age. Maybe he's driving a nice car or she's got on the very best and latest from Louis Vuitton. Stylish, yeah. Most of us think some thoughts about what we might think is going on there. We can kind of be judgmental sometimes when we see things like that. However, looking through a lens of 2022 to Victorian times might make the women of Victorian times appear to be gold diggers, but in reality, it was because all of their financials were tied to their husbands, legally too. Which, if you can imagine, that system didn't work too well. What if your husband is broke? What if your husband is running amok with sultry lasses on the street corners? Like I said before, no divorce, but even if she could leave him easily, supporting herself afterwards was going to be an issue, especially financially. Number three, birth factory. Just pump them out. The faster the better. Quantity over quality, just, just get them out. The use of birth control, as you can tell, was not a common practice. Anyone who's over the age of 25, ask your grandparents how many brothers and sisters they have. I'm willing to bet it's in the six to eight range. Let me know in the comments below, I'm curious. A trend that would continue for a few decades after. Education is important, and I'll get to that in my next part. Women were simply expected to act this way. Maybe it was the sign of the times since the Industrial Revolution was in full swing. Maybe the factories needed workers, I don't know. Which in case you didn't know, they used children as employees. Maybe not so nice. Unfortunately, that was when there was an issue, and there were many. They had no HR to go to, and that was the least of their worries, really. Number two, no school for you. 
No higher education for women. Banned from going to university. I don't think so, not very nice, no, no. Honestly, any society that doesn't want half of their population to go to school probably has a few things to work out. It's a boys club and they can only go to university so that they can learn to be smarter and be businessmen so they can earn money and thus have the facilities to court a woman who really doesn't have a choice anyway. Women had jobs, not careers. And they were all the jobs that you can think of. The ones that were too feminine for men as women were too feeble to participate in a men's job, which is just the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. I'm happy to say that in 2022, we showed them wrong. Chetty loves everyone. Just remember that, I love everybody. You go, girls. Number one, strict rules. Okay, so after a night in the bed sheets with the gal that you love, or maybe the one that you found, there's a good chance that nine months later, a smaller version of you two could be walking around. A byproduct of intimacy, if you will. This was always something I wanted to rant about, but I always found it strange how strict parents and teachers from this time were with their kids. You gotta brush your hair, bed made, and whatever you do, don't ask for more gruel. Please sir, could I have some more? Whatever that Charles Dickens book was, I think it was Oliver Twist. They made us read those books as kids, and I don't know why, because they're kind of boring. From the extreme military code ethics happening at home to the long days in a factory at work, being a kid was tough, man. Earning the punk rock blues of today. I'm just a kid and my life is a nightmare. 